concept of tolerance has become all the more recurrent in our culture today. Now, of course, a certain degree of tolerance is necessary for a healthy functioning society. Tolerance of people with different opinions and ideas than our own, tolerance of differing religions and sexual orientations. But when, as a society, you decide that we can now live in a world where you can do what you want, but evade all accountability and receive no judgment, that to me says the concept of tolerance has gone a bit too far. How are we all doing? My name's Christine and welcome back to my channel. In this episode, we will be debunking the lunacy of the modern day concept of tolerance and I will be explaining why we cannot afford to tolerate absolutely everything and how that poses a threat to the core functions of how we operate and civilizations in terms of how we decipher laws and democracy and ultimately exercising our rights to freedoms. Having experienced my fair share of the red pill space, when discussing the issue of promiscuity among women, a lot of the arguments I hear for this behaviour are founded in this idea of, well, I should be able to just do what I want and no one has any right to judge me for it. This line of thinking proves problematic to me and the logic in it is dangerous. The idea that other people will not judge things is not tolerance. You can tolerate something and still judge someone for it. Also, the idea that other people have no right to judge suggests that you have the right to act as you will. You are aiming to oppress the right of someone else to make a judgment on how you have acted, despite the fact that judgment of an action in no way negates the right to perform that action. It's tyrannical at its core because it means one group of people who have certain values and beliefs are able to exercise those values through their behaviors and actions, but anyone opposed to those values and beliefs cannot exercise their right to obtain beliefs that are in opposition to that. I would even go so far as to argue that judging each other is not only human nature, but it is absolutely necessary for us to remain free in our societies, but also to be the best version of ourselves as individuals. So why is judgment necessary? On an individual level, if we're behaving in a way that our peers may deem potentially harmful to us or not in our best interests, we can't really see reality for ourselves in the moment because for whatever reason, our vision of judgment is clouded. We should hope to be able to rely on our friends and loved ones around us to enlighten us, to keep us in check. This idea of tolerance as an excuse to not judge each other is based upon single-mindedness. It gives God complex. It says that we ourselves know best and we will always know best and no one can tell us any different and we ultimately hold the best judgment of ourselves above any human being ever, despite other human beings potentially having more life experience, knowledge and wisdom than we do, or other be other human beings who simply just care about us and want to impart some advice. It's this theme I regularly reference that we keep seeing of separation and independence instead of unity and harmony in all its complexity and nuance. But when we look at this concept on a slightly broader level than intimate and personal, you may argue, Christine, just let people live their lives. Who are you to judge? And absolutely, who am I to judge, this is a good line of thinking. What qualifies me to judge, say, at a level where legal implications would be involved? Me on my own? I should not be positioned as any judge, jury and executioner. But we as individuals, as part of a collective, make up the laws and institutions and thus society around us based on our collective judgments. Our judgment is absolutely necessary for a working democracy and healthy society. What we collectively deem as good and evil allows us to create laws in order to decide what constitutes bad behaviour in society and to decide a punishment for behaviour that we all judge and generally agree is unacceptable. This is why in criminal courts we often have juries because we make our judgments best when we allow for all opinions and perspectives from multiple people. It's a basic human right to have a fair trial and it's fundamental to the rule of law and democracy. For laws to pass in this country, they have to be approved through multiple stages where people are asked to judge the necessity and validity of these laws and these people have been delegated to those positions of judgment by us civilians who judge whether or not they should be or deserve to be in those positions of power. Judgment exists on every plane and dimension of our society and it's imperative to how our society functions, including our law systems, which give us all human rights and our democracies. I am in no way suggesting corruption is non-existent, but for the purpose of seeing why judgment is important, the primary precedent here is a good example. If the doctors in our healthcare systems stop judging what's healthy and unhealthy, where does that leave health? I know this particular topic is debatable because we now live in a world where we're told that unhealthy bodies are in fact healthy, but 
This just speaks to the point that I'm seeking to make. The concept of tolerance has gone too far and we are now tolerating and even promoting things that aren't necessarily good for us. We're social beings. We need each other in many aspects. We can't afford to lose sight of this. A lot of how we behave is down to our perception of how we are judged by others. It's in our psychology. I think this also speaks to the trend of people not necessarily feeling that they can speak freely anymore out of fears of being cancelled or attacked by the PC police. We live in a very George Orwell world world at the moment. Each day it increasingly feels like I'm living in the book 1984. Fantastic read by the way, if you haven't already read it, I do highly recommend it. It was written in 1949 and it's kind of chilling when you look at the world we're living in today. It seemingly predicts a lot of it really well. I'm going a bit off on a tangent, apologies, right back to it. Our nature of conformity, the need to be liked and the need to be right can be interestingly observed through many studies and experiments done looking at human psychology. Psychologist Solomon Ash conducted a series of experiments to demonstrate how people conform in groups. Participants were shown three lines of different lengths, then asked to select which line matched a fourth standard line. When others in the group who were in on the experiment selected the wrong line, many participants would conform to the group pressure and also selected the wrong line. We're conformative beings, so we follow the trends of what most people around us are doing. Now, I know this may be triggering for a lot of people who love to think that they are so unique and individual. I'm not suggesting in any way that each of us doesn't have our own unique personality personalities and ultimately things to offer. But as animals, we are generally conformative to the behaviors of one another. So knowing this, we can see how this could potentially harm us if we all conform to something perhaps unknowingly at the moment, which could lead us down a bad path. More evidence of our need to fit in can be derived from something called normative social influence. Normative social influence is a type of social influence that leads to conformity. It's defined in psychology as the influence of other people that leads us to conform in order to be liked and accepted by them. A study by Schultz in 1999 found that households that received more normative messages describing the frequency and amount of weekly recycling began to have a direct impact on both the household's frequency and the amount of herbicide cycling. The sudden change was due to the fact that the other neighbors' recycling habits had a direct normative effect on the household to change their recycling behaviors. Similar results were apparent in another study in which researchers were able to increase household energy conservation through the use of normative messages. We want our peers to approve of us. Public humiliation is a huge fear for many of us. On the other hand, informative social influence refers to the tendency to conform to what others are doing or saying because we perceive them as a source of accurate information, particularly in ambiguous or uncertain situations. Informational social influence is where a person conforms to gain knowledge or because they believe that someone else is right. Another study, which was conducted by Sheriff in 1935, shows participants who were asked to estimate how much the light had moved in inches individually. It was established that estimates ranged from about two to six inches and and after the individual's responses were recorded, Sheriff placed participants into three groups. He selected the groups based on their responses so that two group members would have a similar estimate and the third would have a very different one. Participants were then asked to say out loud what their estimate was. As nobody was sure of the answer, they looked to the other group members for guidance. Therefore, this experiment is an example of informational social influence. The results from this study confirm that when in ambiguous situations, people tend to look to others for guidance and follow the norm. The point that I'm trying to make is that we are social creatures and judging each other on our behaviors is generally a good thing and very natural to us. This is not to dispute the fact that it can go too far, especially when, as I mentioned before, one person is delegated judge, jury, and executioner. And when you have one person who is judge, jury, and executioner of everyone else, we end up in a totalitarian dictatorship, which isn't good for any of us. Judging others helps us realize our goals, Judging is a good way for us to perceive the world and figure out where exactly we fit in it. When we form opinions of others, we're able to recognize what we like and aspire to be, as well as what we don't like and want to avoid. We all judge. We're predisposed to this natural tendency. It's a part of our human nature. We're not designed to simply tolerate things, especially when toleration involves not making judgments. Toleration is only necessary upon the acceptance of judgment among our peers. There is nothing to suggest that if you're judged for your behavior, that you in any way have to stop acting in that way just because you're being judged for it. And if you don't like the fact you're being judged for it and you don't like the things that people are saying, you can change your behavior, but you can't stop people having their 
judgments. Unless, of course, you're cr committing some kind of criminal act, you should probably stop for the sake of your own freedom and liberty. But generally, if you're doing something and you enjoy it and it's good for you and good for the people around you, the judgments you get shouldn't really bother you. But if you're doing something and the judgments you're getting are feeling like an attack and it's actually affecting you and putting you down, maybe look at what you're doing. Maybe it's not that great for you. The essential basis at the root of this topic comes down to ethics and mortality. Philosophically, I believe the best way to behave for how we conduct ourselves ethically and decide mortality in our cultures is through general will rather than individual will. Given that we're not lone creatures, we need each other, we're collective beings. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a Genevan philosopher born in June of 1712. He put forth these concepts of general and individual will when observing political philosophy for which he presented his observations and conclusions in his book titled The Social Contract, published in 1762. Rousseau envisages three different types of levels of will as being in play. First, individuals all have private wills corresponding to their own selfish interests as natural individuals. Second, each individual insofar as he identifies with the collective as a whole and assumes the identity of citizen, wills the general will of that collective as his or her own, setting aside selfish interest in favour of a set laws that allows all to coexist under conditions of equal freedom. Third, a person can identify with the corporate will of a subset of the populace as a whole. In a well-ordered society, there is no tension between private and general will. Individuals accept that both justice and their individual self-interest require their submission to a law which safeguards their freedom by protecting them from the private violence and personal domination that would otherwise hold sway. German philosopher Immanuel Kant, born just 12 years after Rousseau, acknowledged that he had previously despised the ignorant masses until he came to read Rousseau, came to appreciate the worth that exists in every human being, which is something I think we could all perhaps learn to appreciate a bit more in this age of selfishness. I'm specifically thinking right now of the absurdity that came out of that 25 year old lady's mouth on Piers Morgan when questioned on the morality of her decision making and the impact it would have on her potential children, she answers with, well, they can cry in a Ferrari. A fine example of the ignorance to mortality and absolute egotism displayed in many of us in this modern age. Kant teaches us that actions resulting from desires cannot be free. Freedom is to be found only in rational action. He insists that whatever is demanded by reason must be demanded of all rational beings. Hence, rational action cannot be based upon an individual's personal desires, but must be actioned in accordance with something that he can will to be a universal law. This view roughly parallels to Rousseau's idea of the general will, as opposed to the individual will, where a person shares with the whole community. Universal law in and of itself is a fascinating topic to me, but for the purpose of sticking on topic for the video, I will refrain from that particular divagation. <laughs> the question I'm conclusively raising to you all is which path will you choose to take? The path of tolerance, an individual will, where everyone is free to act as they please, and as a society, we shall hold no objective judgment upon the actions of an individual, therefore deciding there is no right from wrong and abandon all foundations of laws and ethics. Or the path of accepting why a degree of judgment is necessary and general will, where everyone is still free to behave as they wish as individuals, but as a collective, we obtain the right to give our opinions and perhaps disagreement with those actions so to distinguish what we want to see in our lives and in the lives of those we love around us without prohibiting anyone else's rights to deviate from mortality should they wish to do so, but preserving the right to have objective mortality and ethics. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for tuning in. I thoroughly enjoy making these and sharing with you all my personal observations and sharing things that I've learned from external influences. I find all of these things particularly fascinating, especially psychology and philosophy and a lot of physics stuff as well, but I'm not sure if you guys would be particularly interesting in, in, interested in that. I very much look forward to hearing if these particular concepts are of any relevance to you guys and if you see the importance as I do. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it and in the comments below, let me know what you think about the current ideas of tolerance in our culture. Have we become too tolerant of certain things? Where do you think that tolerance has gone too far? 
or perhaps the opposite? Where are we not being as tolerant as we perhaps could be? Please subscribe to my channel to ensure that you don't miss any more episodes of this series. I also have a reaction series, so if you have any videos you want me to react to, leave a link in the comments below. I'm also working on some other content ideas, so be sure to subscribe to ensure that you don't miss any of that either. I very much look forward to reading all of your individual thoughts and observations on this particular episode. I love hearing all perspectives and it's only through people with disagreeing stances that we can broaden our understanding of each other. But most of all, let's try and remain harmonious in the adversity of opinion. Take care.